Welcome back to another Mech Deck Tech. Today and for the next two installments, we have upgrade guides for Doctor Who Precons. We're teaming up with the 13th Doctor and Yasmin Khan, who are passing out 1-1 counters to give our creatures pseudo-vigilance for casting spells from anywhere other than our hand, as well as exile on the top guard of our library so that we can play it from anywhere that's not our hand. Synergy. But before we dive on in, I noticed that most of you still aren't subscribed to the channel. Go ahead and tap that subscribe button for me and ring the bell to ensure that you never miss an episode and maybe even earn yourself a shout out in one of our videos. Speaking of which, today's episode, along with all the Doctor Who episodes, are dedicated to DI Records and their founder, Dakota. DI Records is an independent record label with an emphasis on quality music, mental health, and suicide prevention. There's a link in the description for you to check out all the awesome work that they do. DI Records, you rock. Unlike our last Doctor, who focused on the Suspend mechanic, we're looking for pure impulse draw of eggs on the top card of our library and being able to play it in the same turn. We're doing our standard 10 cards out, 10 cards in, so let's get started with what didn't make that cut. Bill Potts cares about instance, sorceries, and activated abilities that target only them, and with only two or so spells that meet the criteria in the deck, they were an easy cut. If it also worked with triggered abilities, they'd likely have gotten to stay, since it would work with our Doctor, but sadly, it's just not the case. Confession Die was up next, and I know what some of you might be thinking, this artifact enables our commander to pass out those counters that we love so very much. It's true that they do, but we're not a self-mill deck, and splashing in here just doesn't make sense to me. I'd much rather focus on what the deck is already good at, rather than trying to be a jack of all trades. Do you think this is strong enough that I should have kept it in the deck? Let me know in the comments. Dan Lewis follows up our dial, and is really underwhelming here. He turns non-creature, non-equipment artifacts into underwhelming equipment. If we focus more heavily on the clue food token portion of the deck, which was splashed in here from the start, I think he could have hung out, but I think another doctor might at least have a passing interest in him. Decaying Time Loop is more of what Confession Dial was trying to do, which is fill our graveyard to cast our legendary creatures with extra steps. With these two cards being the only real instances of this strategy, I don't think we're going to miss them anytime soon. Frostfair Lorefish is an odd duck to say the least. It's a 7 7 for 7, and sure, you might be able to split that 7 between two turns, and it rewards you with some fish that you likely don't care about and some treasures. I don't think it's worth playing. The fact that we could foretell it to trigger our commander is cool, but we have better ways of pulling that off. Graham O'Brien offers us some food tokens for doing what we already want to do, and that's casting spells from not our hand. Don't get me wrong, I think the ability to gain life can be a useful one, and it might, you know, matter over the course of the game, but since it's not our main strategy, I think we can let him go. Lunar Hatchling follows up that pilot and is looking to escape from our graveyard after having grabbed us a land hand. It's more the same. The stats are decent, but if we're casting from our graveyard, we'd rather do so with flashback. And the five extra cards needed to be exiled just so we can get them from our grave? A little expensive, a little too rich for my blood. Our next card is an interesting piece of equipment in the form of Psychic Paper. It can allow you to change the name and creature type of a creature it's attached to. But aside from a card that we're cutting, I'm not sure why we'd want to change the name or creature type of a card. Am I missing something here? What do you guys think this is meant to be used with in the deck as is? The Jaron Witness is more clue fodder, and to an extent, graveyard hate. They can be flashed in as a 0-4, and if a creature dies as it attacked or blocked by itself, they get exiled and we get a clue. Again, if this deck cared more about the clue kind of synergy, I could see it being decent and like, we could definitely lean into it, using specific cards that force it down to one attacker, one blocker per turn, but as they are, they don't fit in here. Our last card to cut has extra turn potential and acts as a tutor for another doctor. I'm talking about twice upon a time slash unlikely meeting. For three mana, we could search up one of the two other doctors found in the deck. Then we need to cast them. Then we need to have six mana open to get the extra turn and that assumes that our commander is already on the field. It just feels like a lot of setup is required to pull this off, and if we're playing a ton of Doctors in the deck, I could see it sticking around. But with only three of them, maybe four if you were to include the psychic paper that we already cut, I think it's just a little too much setup and a little too much mana to spend to get one extra turn. 
Let's go over what's taking the place of all these cards, starting off our list with Simic Ascendancy, which can pass out counters on its own and act as an alternate win con for us. We do need it to see 20 counters get passed out, so it's likely going to take a few turns to say the least, but it could also act as a decoy for some of our other powerful enchantments in the deck, taking the hit for them. Speaking of powerful enchantments, we also have Hardened Scales. It's going to add an extra plus one plus one counter that our commander is passing out, making our creatures get a little bigger a little faster. It's also a one drop, making it pretty easy to drop out on any turn. And it's going to be the kind of like this style effect, right? We There are other counter doublers, right? Doubling season, parallel lives, things of that nature that we could use in here. They're definitely more expensive they're definitely stronger. But for the sake of this, this guide, we're going to stick with Hardened Scales, but if you have either of, like, the stronger versions of this, definitely recommend playing it over this, in that sense. Or maybe in addition to this, up to you. Hardened Scales also combos off really well with All Will Be One, as does most of our deck. This card is going to add a ton of damage over time and be the bane of our opponent's existence. We have a few cards outside of like Simic Ascendancy and our commander itself that are going to let us pass out counters, including Sisterhood of Karn, who doubles the number of plus one plus one counters on it every time we cast a card from anywhere but our hand. Meaning that like in combination with either Simic Ascendancy or All Will Be One, you know, we could see us get those 20 Ascendancy counters. We could see ourselves fling 20 damage at someone. Definitely a powerful card in the deck, and we're going to see a lot of value come out of it. It was an honorable mention in the last deck, but it's made its way into this one, and that's Sensei's Divining Top. We have quite a few ways to exile the top card of our library or cast straight off the top itself, and this card is going to ensure that we can always do so as cheaply as possible, often being willing to take the place of the card that's sitting there. After that, we move into our new creatures, and this one is arguably a greedy ad in the form of Timestream Navigator. They are here to combo off with one card, and that card is River Song. The two of them allow us to take infinite extra turns for six mana. Since Timestream Navigator puts itself to the bottom of our library to grant us the extra turn, and River Song has us drawing from the bottom instead of the top. Following our Navigator, we have Reality Chip which we're looking to have equipped to allow us to see the top card of our library as well as play it. This enables our commander to let us pass out those sweet, sweet counters that we love so very much, and just kind of acts as like an incidental draw, right? We don't have to have the cards hit our hand, we're able to play them right off the top. So even if our hand is empty, as long as we can continuously play the cards off the top, we're golden. Lelia, the Blade Reforged, is here once again to get bigger every time we exile the top card of our library and lets us cast cards that she exiled when she attacked. She won't be quite as big or like, you know, quite as fast as she was in Timey Wimey, but her plus one plus one counter synergy falls in line nicely here. Kami of Whispered Hopes adds extra counters that we get to pass out and is a mana dork that we get to scale up over time allowing us to tap them for massive amounts of mana to cast some of our bigger spells. This card works really well with our reality chip, allowing us to float a bunch of mana and then kind of use that mana to pay for things off the top. Kami of Celebration brings in another powerful spirit and works well with Whispered Hopes, as well as our commander, allowing them to fuel each other. We're passing out counters to exile cards to cast them to pass out counters and round and round we go. With only one card left, it's our Golden Nightmare of the deck, Edgen Larsenus Ludinist, who allows us to foretell every non-land card in our hand, and then cast them at two less mana, effectively charging us the same, but, you know, we could split it up over a few different turns, I think it's really powerful. The fact that he might let us go to creature is icing on the cake. But we can put a ton of cards into exile with him, wait for the perfect moment to pop off with a ton of value. He enables our commander more so than any other card in the deck, and basically lets us store mana in exile. We do have a few honorable mentions that didn't make the cut for various reasons, but since we limit ourselves to 10 cards in, 10 cards out, not every upgrade is gonna make it. 
Starting off those mentions is Atali Primal Conqueror, who's going to give us potentially four free spells and allow us to pass out a ton of counters. Thaldron Dread Wolf Herald follows up that Dino, and there's actually a ton of cards from that pre-con, Exit from Exile, that could really slot in here that I didn't mention in the deck. But she's going to let us get a 2-2 Green Wolf that we could, you know, pop up with our commander. She's also able to enable the whole, like, we're going to exile some cards off the top of our library. We get to play them this turn. You could definitely smash, I think, these two decks kind of, like, together. Obviously, not entirely too many cards. But, like, there are definitely cards that you could kind of hot swap between these two decks. So if you have them both and you're looking to, like, kind of consolidate, I think that's a good way to go. It's a red deck, it's looking to do some exile shenanigans, and also Jessica's Will is just good stuff. Uh, so nice mana boost, pot, you know, potential to exile some cards, potential to do both. Uh, just an all-around good time. It's a plus one, plus one counter deck, right? Uh, any counters actually work with the Ozolith, but like, in this case, plus one, plus one counters. Should our creatures leave the battlefield, this card could definitely, you know, save those counters, pass them back out later. Works wonders with All Will Be One. Super strong. This one is definitely a budget thing. It's a $33 card. Um, if you have it, definitely play it. If you don't have it, you know, for me personally, this would kind of eat up a budget pretty quickly. Spending $33 bucks a card to upgrade a deck. But... If you have the money, spend it. It's worth it. Last up is Passionate Archaeologist. While we are exiling cards, we're also playing some off the top of the deck. And with that, like, division in the deck, where we're kind of doing it both ways, I feel like it's still good here, but it's not as great here as it was in Timey Wimey, which is why it didn't quite make the, the upgrade guide. But guys, that is the guide. You know, were there cards that I cut that should have stayed? Cards that I added that you think don't belong? You know, which Doctor would you like to see next? Let me know in the comment section down below. And as always, if you want help to build your own decks or just sling some spells on the spell table, consider joining the Discord. But until next time, good luck with your builds.